Matthias is up next. He's going to present on VAST, which is visibility across space and time. OK, yeah. Um, I started with Bro maybe seven years ago. And I was just a student, still in Munich. And Robin was my kind of my student advisor at the time. And Bro was pretty much unusable from a non, or for anybody outside the Bro community at that point. It was really hard to start. Um, it's come a long way since. And the first time it really clicked to me was probably a year ago, where I saw somebody else picking up the Bro theme. Uh, let's see if that shows. Like the internet first started thinking about bro logs being something special. Like this was something that was just out there, and I realized, huh, other people start thinking about bro too. And um, so it's, it's, it's been moving on since then. And um, the, the, the key question is, if you, if you know the bro logs, and uh, you have a lot of them, then the, ne the next question is, what are you going to do with them? And this is pretty much what I'm going to talk about and what the whole point of VAST is. And let me start with a demo that sh shows you pretty much what you can do nowadays with it. So VAST at this point consists of two parts, a server part and a client part. And right now I'm just starting the server part um, in log level five, and I'm gonna spin up some internal components which I call the core, and I'm not detaching the process um, in background, actually it's gonna run in foreground. So this is our server, it does a bunch of stuff, it's not, much, it's not as important. But now I'm going to get data into it. And I have something prepared, some, some logs from a trace um, that we use for unit testing. These are, uh, yeah, you can see a little bit uh, about that data. It's the trace that we, that we ship with Bro2, 850 megabytes. Um, let's see how many connections. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's just a toy example, but I think it will sh show some capabilities. Last year at BroCon, I showed a, a performance aspect more, and this, in this talk, I will more focus on, on features. And um, now let's, let's import some Bro logs, and all you really have to do is to, um, point them, oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, this is star.log. I'm just taking all those logs in there, and they're now indexed. And um, I'm going to also add the pickup trace itself. So we'll talk about the fancy pyramid in a bit. But um, now this 850 megabyte trace is also in there. And I'm going to start with some queries against the system. So the dual to import is the export command. And for now, I'll just say ASCII. And oh, my shell is apparently doing this for me. <laughs> um, in, I'm going to launch an historical query. Say so you're going to start with 10 events. I don't want this to reveal. OK. <laughs> um, 10 events. and. I'm going to just say duration greater 60 seconds. So what does that do? That gives me 10 events. But what does the duration field do here? That is taken from the con log. If we look at the con log itself, it has, it has a field name duration. So what happened is that these logs have been parsed and typely, in a, in a typed way imported into the system. So 
if I would give it a different, uh, if I would add a string right here, say test or something, the query would fail because it fails a type check. Um, I, I can actually output that data, not just in ASCII, which is the standard vast, concise format, but also as a bro log, because what I really put in there are bro logs, and all I'm querying are bro logs as well. So let's, let's do the same thing again, but just replace ASCII with bro. And then it's the same thing, uh, it's barely visible right here, but that's a bro log. And that's possible because the type information has completely been retained. And um, it's also possible to have, whoops, oh, I re replaced the wrong thing. I can add JSON too. And JSON is a bit lossy in the sense that it, you, you just lose a bit of the type information when you just have an object here. This is a, this is a record. But records in Bro's data model have also names. The field, they're here, but they can also be type names. And at that point, it, it's becoming difficult. So that's why the uh, string type always is shipping with the actual JSON data. So it's just an object where you have a unique ID, a timestamp, and the value consists of the data plus the type. So that's just just shows that these output representations are arbitrary. And it really matters that the internal representation be, can be converted to anything. And I've just had these three formats that I thought might be useful um, at the beginning. Um, now, you know, this is a test trace. There's not too much exciting in there. But I still wanted to explore it a little bit. So I'm going to now switch back to the ASCII format for the rest of it. And um, let's look at some connections that are a little longer. What, what this duration field really means is if we look a bit at the debug output, uh, what, what happened here, um, there is somewhere, I can see that right now. I don't think I can see it right now. But um, what happened is that as the query AST got constructed, it looked at all records that had a name, a name as we saw here. Now, where is that duration? Right there. That's a field name of a bro record that had that name duration. And any valid unique or, or suffix is, is a valid query expression. So it actually would have been. Uh, constructed or qualified back into something bro, con, and then duration, where the dot here is the equivalent of the dollar dereference operator that you're familiar with from the bro language. So now let's look at some larger, um, I think I need two columns here, yeah. So let's look at some larger question, uh, larger connections over 600 seconds. And um, in particular, let's let's look at uh, I think I need to add a little more. So let's look at. Ooh. So I just uh, increased really here. This is what I just typed in. A historical query, 20 events, duration greater 600 seconds. So now uh, there's also a duration field in the bro files event. So it extended to both con and files. Wherever there was a field named duration, this query got applied. And um, so I, I saw that and I saw, oh, there's a mime type in there. And um, Maybe it's well, it might be interesting to look on based on mind types. If something is an executable, and this is actually it's probably you know a little bit more identified already. It's a PE executable. Mm. Um, it, it's it's uh, mind types. They give you 
a bit of um, a very clear idea usually what's in there. Well, they can be fake too, but mm, if a standard search also for an incident responder involves just searching based on MIME types. So uh, let's look a little bit about those for the executables. And here I'm just going to say okay, anything that is, has MIME type name field that's executable. So out come all the executables from the files log. And um, here I just use string equality. I could also do a substring search, and that is, I could do something like PDF in MIME type. So uh, the in operator is equivalent to a substring search, and that is a custom operation for, on the index. It's not touching the base data. This is purely answered from the index, the substring. And I, I get some PDFs. Um, and okay, let's let's because we also added some PCAPs that say now I'm interested in actually looking at the PDF, and I want to do this in a single system. So I'll export the corresponding trace, the PCAP packets. And I just I just you know I wrote this query down before because it takes a lot of type. But really what I do is uh, I say destination equals to, say, I'm going to look at the first one here, at that, that log line. And I'm going to say destination equals to this. This is an IP address. Destination port is uh, 1750. It doesn't matter what type, TCP, UDP, or ICMP. And I especially, essentially speci specify the connection tuple. And if I have a large database, I would probably have to specify a time range, too, in order to get the unique connection. But um, I here said here export PCAP format. So what will happen? That a raw PCAP file be, will be written to standard output. I don't want that quite yet because my terminal will not be very happy. And instead, what I'll do is I pipe it to IP sum dump and uh, want to reorder the packets. I'm going to tell you in a second why. It's just because BAST is currently inherently asynchronous, meaning um, you get a, the data is distributed horizontally, and I don't have yet implemented a deterministic uh, retrieval scheme. So it could happen that actually one event arrives before the other, although they have been in the original stream, uh, vice versa. And in a packet trace, that would kind of make it, that would have some bad effects. So uh, you can post-process the trace with IP sum dump. And uh, this didn't used to work because most modern versions with the PCAP use nanosecond timestamps. And um, I also use that modern interface in VAST. And so I sent a patch to Eddie Kohler, and he integrated that. And now it's part of IP sum dump. You can also have now nanoseconds in IP sum dump. And so I'm going to write this file to HTTP PDF. The, oh, probably PDF is the wrong word. It should be a, really a, a PCAP. And then, OK, I'm going to use Wireshark, sorry. But you've all just seen this before. This should be nothing special. There are the packets. Um, each packet corresponds to a single event. And what vast index is just the connection for tuple, the timestamp, skip the payload. So you, if you really wanted to search on the payload, you could try to index it, but it's, it wouldn't be very clever. Reassemble the trace. There we go. Um, HTTP response. Here's the PDF in there. OK, let's say uh, I want to save this and save this as the uh, HTTP uh, PDF. It's not yet a, quite a PDF, but I, I wanted to, I, will, I want to get to this point where I just can, where it's not a, it's not a lot of effort. So 
PDF is kind of a mixed text format. What I'll do is I'll just strip out some stuff in the beginning, the response. This is how a PDF starts. So there's even syntax highlighting in my editor. Um, that's the XREF table at the very end, so I'll search just forward. And there's some more stuff at the end that I'll just crop out. And now I should be able to hopefully see that PDF. Oh, it just popped up here, right there. Oh yeah, that's a pattern for a pneumatic boxing glove from 1938. Um, yeah, not sure what, what, what it does, but I hope I could convey that we have in a single system logs, events, and um, can work can work can work really in our mindset of the analyst, where you say, hey, you start with that sort of explorative analysis and then want the ground truth, which for a lot of incident responders are the PCAPs. And that works in a single system. So that so that gets me back to <laughs> that thing, which we <laughs> Uh, which we, Seth and I came up with yesterday night, at, I think after midnight in the hotel room. But I just changed something. I, there was parsed data earlier. I think structured is what I like better because I think, I think about the raw data being, say, the PCAPs as we had them, and structured really just an enhancement in terms of types and structure and framing. Um, ideally, this is a one-to-one -one transformation, and you can revert it. And, and that's, that would mean no loss in fidelity. And I like to think about bro events, actually, that way. They, are, they strip out some information. So for example, you never know how much white space was in there in your, in your ASCII-based protocols. That's often a variable length. So you could not really go back to the original data. But um, you could generate something that's maybe semantically valid. So from all the HTTP events in their sum, the, the headers and the bodies and the chunk data. You could go back and reassemble a, the raw data. You could create at least an HTTP request. And that is, it really boils down to the notion of ground truth. What is, uh, for you, an actionable ground truth? And I think in network forensics, we have that kind of, as soon as you show somebody PCAP, you start believing them. Say, yeah, OK, you, you have a point. And, and that's really what we have here with, uh, in the context. This is an instantiation of that pyramid for network traffic, where we have, where, and I think this is something I haven't showed. I wish I could have shown that already. Um, but I want to get the bro events themselves into VAST and then search over those events. And um, essentially navigate seamlessly between those two layers. Um, this, is, this is challenging from a vo data volume point of view, but um, that's, that's a separate aspect. But it would be interesting to have, to not lose any information, or at least from a semantic level. Okay, this is the one that Seth was looking for earlier. <laughs> that was another instantiation of that. And I'd say this is the host-based context. So if you think about program execution and um, think that the stream of instructions as they grind through the CPU are the ground truth. Then you could say abstract from that and focus only on system calls to identify relevant operating system behavior. And from there on, say, go even further and say, hey, this process started and this terminated, this slept for a bit. Go, go in, in, in higher level summaries and maybe at some point you only look at the exit status of the process. So I think it's a pretty it's, it's, it's nothing deep in that sense. You can create many instances based on your context. But um, the key point here to take away is as the analyst, you would like to enter at all layers. And, and with VAST, I'm trying to build such a system where you can, when you really need to go to the raw packets. Yeah, you can do it in the same system. And if you're just interested in alarms, okay, well, they're in there too. And, what we have today is a scattered landscape where for each layer we have a dedicated tool, a set of tools specifically. And there's little bridging between those vertical layers. Okay, so a bit more about VAST. What, 
What does it do? What is it trying to enable? And I'm really pushing on a usable system for forensics, and that's the key goal will be that this system is interactively usable from the command line, as I showed you, also with larger data sets. And um, we've seen something as I just dug through the data. This is a process of iterative refinement of, of a query until you converge to something that you think is, is yeah, gets you to the point. Also key in the architecture is that type type information will be retained. That, that en enables not only type-specific optimizations, but as we can see later also, makes it easier to navigate in the vertical layers. And as a consequence, you know, the query language is strongly typed. For the operator, that means also, you know, if you, if you make a mistake, if you add a string, try to get a, uh, if you combine operators with operands that are not compatible, then yeah, that you get an early warning there back. And um, I've shown you historical queries which go back in time, but I could have flipped a switch, that dash H switch that I had early on at dash C, and that query becomes continuous, and whenever new events come in, it'll fire and spit out the data to a sink. So the sinks really here, one, one was an ASCII sink, one was a PCAP sink, one was a JSON sink. Um, this is the export component. This is how the data gets displayed to the user. The import component, we've seen a PCAP and a Brolog importer. Um, I have something not merged yet, but it's, it's working already. It's a Kafka importer and JSON importer. Um, I, I face some quest, uh, trouble here in, JSON, in identifying type information in, in JSON data. So if you have, have ideas about schema inference and that sort of stuff, and to convert JSON data into a strongly typed model, please talk to me afterwards. Um, this is just a, really a transposition of the same. I think I just said that. But let's get back to the other two components I haven't talked about, which are right between import and export. This is where most of the stuff happens. The, ar the archive and the index are the two key components here. The archive is really just a key value store of batches of events. So each each um, event here, so one of those turquoise um, yeah, squares, uh, they have a unique ID in VAST as they enter the system, and those batches are associated with another ID, and that's the granularity of lookup there. And then the indexes. The indexes are built in addition. Uh, they're a very specific type. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And they reference events in the archive. So um, this... Let's talk a little bit about the big data landscape. That is also something that we eventually have to touch because the system is set out to scale. Um, MapReduce has a computational model that's very expressive. You can compute any function over a large data set in MapReduce terms. But the problem is that this is not interactive. For each MapReduce job, you'd have to perform a full scan of the data conceptually. There are optimizations, but you will not escape that fundamental model. On the other end of the spectrum is in-memory cluster computing, which is Spark, is also a Berkeley effort coming out of the AMP lab. And here the premise is that you can fit your entire data set into memory, and once you have it there, you can perform, again, arbitrary functions, compute them over the data, and get really fast speed on that and you can do that interactively. But when your data set gets too large, then you really degrade to this uh, MapReduce model where you have to load in the entire data, process it, get to the next point, and so on. And what VAST is, is uh, somewhere else, really. Um, this is a distributed system, but it tries not to suffer from either of these problems. And we have data sets that are terabytes, petabytes, even larger. That, that, that will be hard to fit in a distributed cluster, at least today. And so I 
follow this approach with VAS that you only need to load the relevant section of in, into memory and can perform efficient computations on that. And that we'll see later how that's going to be achieved. And so in a way, you would probably think, now that's a, well, that sounds like a seam, right? And yeah, it, it kind of is that. So um, Splunk is probably a good comparison, but it has a very different data model. It really operates on unstructured text and, and tokenization to extract some information from it. There's no typing. And I couldn't really find details about how it works internally. So this is with a caveat. I could found an error message in the internet where there was a B tree class referenced and exception was thrown. So um, I think there must be a B tree in there somewhere. <laughs> and if not, it's just a timestamp field or something. It has since version 4.0 its own map reduce implementation. So that's that's the model they do. They sweep over the data and um, yeah, for each query that you do, maybe plus some magic that tries to make it faster. Uh, it's hard to say because it's really closed source and the license uh, for many it's a chunk of change that's not affordable. Um, if you have it, apparently the money, then it, it seems to work well, but you need to spend a lot of resources. Elasticsearch, we've heard about that already. Uh, the data model is also rather rich. It's really inherited from Lucene, and Lucene is uh, an Apache project that is a, based on an inverted index. That means also you take the document tokens and uh, associate, essentially, create something like a table of those documents to the, uh, the tokens when you want to look for a specific token, then you uh, take the document ID as where it points to. And it, it is, what they do essentially is an index lookup. It's open source and licensed under Apache. So with VAST, it's, it, VAST is inheriting bros type model that has proven very well for the domain. And in that sense, it is the same data model. The type of indexes are bitmap indexes, and um, it's also open source with a very permissive license. Um, this is the type system of VAST. It's pretty much the same as Bro. Um, we have basic types, arithmetic types, network-based types, address, subnet, port, timestamps, then container types, and records. So records are C structs. That helps. This is the query language. It's really just Boolean algebra. You have conjunctions, disjunctions, and or not, and then predicates, which are the elements that you chain A and predicate B or not, C and D, for example. And those predicates, this, for example, would be one predicate here, for each H equals to 10, 10, 10, 0, 0, 1, and so on. There's a few um, specific type of extractors. We've seen the schema extractor. That was, here was just duration, where arc was duration and an arbitrary prefix, if you want to make it unique. Time is a meta extractor, it just takes the timestamp from the event, so is the type of the event. And uh, something I'll show a little later is what that spe specific type extractor does. It actually performs a meta query. If you wanted to look for an all strings in your database or all addresses, you could just say here colon and then address. I think I have that somewhere maybe in the examples. Oh yeah, here. This looks for the substring foo in all values and all columns, so to say, that are of type string. And um, yeah, the typical arithmetic operators are available. S soon there will be some sort of matching, that's, but that's down the line. These are some examples of values. So there exists a unambiguous grammar for how to represent values. Each of them have a specific type. So that's a double, for example. That's a count. That's an integer. These are ports. And the question mark here is the, is the transport protocol. If you use a wildcard of questions, if the question mark is, then you cannot infer it. That applies to all sorts of ports. But you can also look for just specific ones. Sets are also supported. And you can do set membership queries. This is in and some syntactic sugar for it. So what are these hits? 
when, when you ask the index with the query, what's happening? So what the index generates is a sequence of bits, a bit vector. And it's from the range of 0 to 2 to the 64 minus 1. It's not ever hold a memory like that. It's actually encoded with the run length encoding. That's how, why it's viable. And the nice thing is that when you want to compose hits, let me go a little bit further here. Say we have three independent results for predicates. You can compute them all independently and then say, okay, well, my, my predicate x is that address, and then I have another one, predicate y less than 42, and then maybe a substring search z is um, should probably be the other way around, that element there. Um, and then a substring search. I can compute for each of these three predicates the results independently and then take those bit vectors and perform the bitwise operations on them. So whatever comes out at the end is, in this case, the conjunction or the ending of all of those together, and that represents the result. So um, results in VAST are composable, which for other types of indexes is typically not the case. And that means you can do a lot of stuff in parallel. And these, these bit vectors are actually stored in an associative data structure. Think about it like a table. So say I have the value 2. Internally, what happens is for each numeric value, I think it starts at 0. 0, 1, 2, and 3 are all valid instances of the table, but only where the value is 2, there's going to be a 1 in there. The rest are zeros. So the next row comes in, there's a 1. I'm going to add a 1 at this specific column, and the rest zeros. So now when I want to look for some specific value, I just take that column out there and combine it accordingly. It's a very, it's a specific type of bitmap encoding called the equality encoding. Fast uses something more sophisticated, but that's irrelevant for now. OK. Some of you have been a Brocon 14, and I've also talked about VAST at that point. And since then, the implementation of continuous queries is available. Um, if there's time, we can talk about that. In a way, VAST can be seen as a time machine. Not, it's not full, fully the same, but yeah, it does index the connection for tuple, the timestamp. And actually, it can combine for those of you who have used the, used the um, time machine, there are a few annoyances in, in operational use. As for one, whenever you shut it down, the indexes were lost. You could not recover them. So that's just the packets are just one other type of events in VAST. It's, there's no exception made for them. One, once I converted them from the PCAP into the internal data model, they're just treated like any other event. So it's just a side effect of the implementation that you get a time machine. And um, I, okay, I added a little bit of mm, uh, useful, really useful um, um, stuff from the original time machine, which is the cutoff. And you can cut off a connection flow, not just individual packets, after a fixed amount of bytes, and then forego the rest of the of the TCP byte stream or the connection byte stream. So there's new event sources. There's a BGP DOM parser. If you do analysis with that, that was for a project. And the JSON Kafka is not yet merged, but that technically works. It spits out JSON. It's just I need to figure out how to find an unambiguous presentation. And most importantly, the distributed architecture, this is where I spend most of the time with. And that's what's really just missing also. Uh, testing on that end for, for the first release. So uh, let's actually talk about that a bit more. So we've seen that vast daemon in the top window. It's just a node. A node is a container for components in vast. And uh, there's an importer and an exporter. These are the duals of each other. One is to get the data in. It's a data receiving point, and others that's an uh, extraction point, and you would attach the sources on either end. Say the exporter, once it gets events, can say relay them into a ASCII or PCAP or Bro sync. 
And uh, so these individual components are, um, yeah, they all run independently and concurrently. They actually, they're all actors in the actor model, um, which come, goes back to CAF, which we've seen in Broker. It's the same underlying programming model. So it's really, it's all message passing between these components, and they all run in parallel. This is all you have to think about. So really, that's, that's a nice benefit. There's no data races by design because they only communicate with message passing. There's no locks. There's not a single lock in the entire VAST code, which makes it easy to uh, and, and fun to write, actually. Then another side effect of this actor model way of thinking is that these things, these components, can run anywhere. And the deployment is independent of the logic. So what that means is here, I can replicate those three nodes. And I can, in this case, I've just identically replicated the same structure inside. And what happens if, um, let's, uh, well, one, one thing I wanted to add, sorry here, is that uh, once you cross out that process, this is really just an OS level process, you have to serialize your messages and then Everything inside, any message inside, is not expensive to, to send. It's like a func function call amortized. Um, you only have to worry about really getting the data into the system when you have multiple machines. So let's say we have three nodes. They all do the same thing. This is kind of a shared nothing architecture. Um, they all serve the same purpose. They don't have to communicate much. And then, OK, what, what happens is that a source could load balance over those importers to get the data in at all nodes for each chunk of events that it produces. Same thing, um, you could imagine instantiating three exporters that they perform the queries and you know, they aggregate the funnel, the results back to the sink. That's what happens really in the underlying architecture. But this is a flexible model. This is just a shared nothing instance. You could, based on your hardware, you could say something, oh, I have something more complicated, right? Let's look at this big node here, which is, has a beefy hard disk and two SSDs that you would like to harness. So what you could do is you could just spin up two importers there that funnel to the same archive um, and send their, uh, their indexing data to the two specific indexes. And whenever you query something, uh, you do, do the vice versa. So this is, nothing needs to change in the program logic, this is just the deployment. It's completely independent. And really the topology, the network topology is independent from the program logic and that means it's, it's very flexible to use. It scales up and it scales down, which many other systems have, have struggling with. They're either optimized for one use case. Okay, let's, uh, this distributed stuff is a bit more hairy. I hope I can get the demo done. Um, okay, let's shut this down. Let's clear out some. Yeah, oh, I hope I didn't delete my source code. <laughs> um, <laughs> it would have been a nightmare. Um, so. Okay, what I'll do is I'll start another node, really. So that, as we can see now, that's an, it's a node and it's gonna use the directory vast. Uh, it's gonna be a core, so it will have these four actors in there that we just saw earlier. It runs in the foreground. I'm just gonna give it two threads. On my MacBook, I have only four cores available. That's actually also something neat, I haven't told you. Um, those components, they exist internally hundreds of thousands of actors running in parallel. And based on the number of cores you have, they, they, they will always be scheduled over the maximum number of threads you give the, the application. So if you have eight cores, you want to have eight threads, and then those high-level components are scheduled onto eight threads. And if, as long as there's enough work available, um, you will always have maximum CPU utilization. So it's a higher level way of thinking about concurrency. I'm gonna call this node foo, 
and okay with a bit of logging robustity. So I, I just so what you know there's there's okay we have, what I haven't talked really about is this key value store. There's some sort of global state necessary to coordinate the nodes. Um, Apache has Zookeeper. Ah, damn it, I just opened the wrong thing. Okay, so I showed up here. Good. Um, and uh, so vast nodes can peer, that's the bottom line, and then they share some global state, and you can reference components across nodes. They become a logical overlay. Um, at this point, it's a little bit of manual work. I, I would like that to go all away eventually. From the user perspective, you just say, hey, I want to export my data into some sort of format, and the rest has been taken care of. But um, this is not yet wrapped nicely behind a command line interface or user or web app. So for now, it's just really, it gives you an idea of what the application does underneath. It's not something that you would have to do yourself when you use the system when it will be released. Okay. And so by default, this guy listens on port 42,000. Uh, I clicked again on something. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to use another endpoint for this node, it's going to be 42,100. So they communicate over TCP. You could also use, uh, in the future, they're planning something like domain sockets to, it's, it's not as important for now. Um, I'm going to give it a different directory, VAS2. Also in the foreground, two threads, call it bar, a bit of uh, logging verbosity here. Okay, this is kind of an empty container. As you can see, there's not much happening. It's just some yeah, they're, they're, they're the core act, this is kind of, yeah, it's, we, will, we will populate this one right now. And um, let's see, where is that shell? Okay, I'll just spawn a new one. Okay. What what we'll do now is just one second. Okay. Okay. I will. We'll just connect the two. So I say there's a command vast peer. And by default, if I do not specify the endpoint, I will talk to this first vast node, and I'll peer with the second node. And that was listening on that endpoint. Uh, oops, okay, that probably is. Yeah, so now they share the same key value store. And whenever I change one node, all other nodes will have the same view about the global ecosystem of, of vast components. And they can be, <coughs> have a hierarchical namespace, you can really do stuff with them. It's not, it's an implementation detail, but it, hope it conveys a bit of what's going on under the hood. Eventually, this is a broadcast model right now. It, I want to move to something more fault tolerant. We've heard that in the broker discussion yesterday, something like Raft or so. And ideally, we'll just implement it once in broker and then Bass can use it too. Um, Okay, let's, let's populate this other container. That was at this endpoint. And I'm going to spawn, first of all, an importer there. So I just added an importer right here to this bottom one guy. This, this other guy got wind of it, so they kind of know about each other. I'm also going to spawn an archive. As you can see, really, I'm creating a topology on the fly based on with some internal components that are available in VAST, I can create whatever sort of topology I want from the command line. It's, it's not bound to, there's nothing hardwired inside the program 
in the source code that says you have to run it that way. It's really it's an infinite amount of topology is possible, and I think it will be interesting to figure out over time which one makes sense the most. We're also going to spawn an index. Now, there's one component I haven't talked about much. Um, so it's the identifier. This is the guy in the middle. But right now, we have kind of that architecture. There's a node foo, a node bar. And uh, these edges haven't been created yet. I'll, right now, we have just this guy on the left. And this guy has actually the identifier. So I want that other guy, bar, also to uh, use the same identifier. That's because that will eventually go away. But for now, is there's a central component that gives out IDs to events as they come into the system. And um, whenever, you get, whenever those importers get a batch of events, say a million or so, they just say, hey, identifier, please give me a million events. And then they will assign them to them. And that's important because later in the archive, each event has a unique ID. So um, you want to find every single event and don't unambiguously. OK. Um, we have spawned an archive and an index. We still need to connect the two. That's, that's by hand. So the importer, let's say, connect that with the index, connect that with the archive. Um, and also with the identifier, but the identifier actually lives on the other node, so we have to qualify it. It's by default, I'm just going to use an at sign for the node names, and not right now. I'm going to say at, ooh, wait. There's already exist. Hmm. <coughs> Uh, I actually I am at bar, so this is because I connected the vast client to bar. I do not need to add at bar, so that would be redundant. I could do this. I wanted the. Um, hmm. You know, okay, I'm going to try the other way around. Let's see. Why not? Maybe I'm. Got it wrong. OK, I think, yes, unfortunately, I, it's going to be hard to debuff that here. But um, I think you got the, the, the demo wouldn't have been super exciting, really. It just shows how you can. <laughs> <laughs> it would really just show this. So I have it also painted, so that will, I'll show what it does. Um, it would take a bro log and load balance batches over those two importers. And you would see that half of the events come in this node, and the other half go in there. So that's one way, say, to if on your box, and I don't want to make any assumptions about the homogeneity of the boxes. You don't have to buy the same set of machines. That's why you can, in, in, if you just want to use all available machines you have, and one is much, much stronger than the other, yeah, it may, may make sense to kind of give it a different function in your ecosystem. And that's an advantage of this, this flexible model. So what I would have also done then created an exporter. That's not a very good way, though, maybe, because now we have crossing the boundary four times here to two processes. So there's a lot of communication. When, this, when the exporter asks a query, it would go to the index first, get back one of those bit vectors, those results, and then go with that to the archive and get its result. And it does it quite often. So it would make more sense to kind of also replicate those guys and have them in there. And uh, that this communication is in the same process, and so it's really cheap. Um, but then you could also say, well, we can also have two different syncs. And they write in two different files or something. But eventually, you want a single homogeneous view, so you would end up with something like that, where uh, you have the sync, just the actual results being forwarded to the sync in there put together. And that's why we had to run IP sum dump earlier, because it could well be that, uh, based on the asynchronous nature of the system, that these come out in different orders as they went in. OK. I hope this will be released soon. Um, I'm not adding any more features. This Kafka thing, is, is I would like to get in. But other than that, it will just be tested. There are some issues with sizes of 
some fancy indexes like container indexes. You can actually index a set and uh, perform set membership queries too. I haven't showed you that. Mm. And uh, with the string size, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on, on figuring out what the, what the issue is. What will come further down the line is really improved bro integration. We do not, maybe you can skip the process of going through bro logs and have your high fidelity archive being vast, which, which on demand gives you the level of information that you want. So going back to this, my vision is that this will be vast, this prism, no, what we say, triangle, <laughs> pyramid. And um, you can, based on wherever you are in your analysis process, extract the right level of data and, and get it on demand. It's not that you have it all the way, you do not have it um, sitting around in its original form, but there's a single entry point. And um, so I mentioned some size is issues right here, but on the plus on the side, if we look at PCAPs, PCAPs only take two thirds of their original space in VAST because VAST is just dumb and applies compression to any event. It doesn't differentiate. So inside VAST, each event, is, each packet is an event, and an event by default um, gets compressed. So this is just a side effect. You could essentially store your PCAPs in there and get searchability plus, say, two thirds of space savings. I uh, want to go to um, more clear fault tolerance models as we scale up with the system. There will be stragglers, there will be failures. How to accommodate these um, will be an interesting question. Um, for one, there will be data replication necessary that you have redundancy, multiple archives and indexes that receive the data. And also you would like to resume queries that go a little longer. And um, this is actually quite nice because really an intermediate result is a bit vector that you ended or ORed or not, performed not on. And uh, you could just save that intermediate result and work on from there if, if you have some context on how you got there. That's, Spark does this very well in the sense that it tracks the lineage, the set of up transformations that have been applied to the original data and thereby knows exactly where to continue in case of failure. So that's something we can learn from and apply here too. And uh, so I, I talked about the whole big data story earlier on um, and VAST really can do lookups. And this is, this is primarily what it should is designed for to do fast lookups, not to do arbitrary computation. If you want to do ML or complicated algorithms over your data, um, I would like to create an interface so that you can pipe all that stuff to your computational framework of choice. And this Broncom, we haven't seen much about spicy, too bad. Um, that's Robin's child, I don't know, there he is. he's probably sitting outside. Oh no, there he is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, not sitting outside that you're lazy just because you have a stand. <laughs> um, so uh, SPICY allows us to really, um, I think, get a great deal of, coming back to this pyramid, I, I don't know if I like it, but okay. Um, SPICY really enables you to just apply uh, easily structure over your raw data by making it very simple to create parsers for protocols, file formats, anything that has structure. So my goal is also to just interface vast with SPICY so that you can just benefit all of a sudden of this, say, uh, tar, tar events and search over the tar files based on the tar analyzer or decoder in, in SPICY. Even though actually what you just, you never really deconstructed that, that was SPICY and VAST just benefits from it. 
Okay, that's the talk for now. If you uh, have any questions, I'm all ears. Yeah. Yes, um, so that the fundamental questions about the pyramid from the raw data to the structures. Yeah. So when you build the uh, archive based on the structured data, uh, is, so it's always exactly the same structure. So the event must be a lot different event. You just import mm -hmm. all those different types of events, and then you um, create archive in the exact same structure. Okay, yeah, I think your, your question is, do the events which come out from different sources have the same form inside the archive? And the answer is yes, they have the same format. Um, they have been converted at that entry level in, into a vast specific format. And the idea is to convert them in a lossless way. And then later at index time decide if you really want to say save some space, you say don't, you don't skip the data part of the PCAP packet. Mm -hmm. But by default, you, you just transform the data and one-to-one -one map, mapping and then in, into the vast representation and from there on you work with it. And that's what, in the archive, they're all in the internal format. <laughs> from uh, transformation from raw data to the same. Yeah. Okay. I think I get your question. <laughs> yeah. I think I get your question. Essentially, you're asking: Can I do? Can I revert this? Can I go back? Or can I get the original data back now that it's in there? Is, is there actually a way to get the original way back? So, for pcaps, yes. I mean, I'm for that. I'm using the pcap. I'm trusting that the pcap reading and writing is is. is the same leads to the same result. Now, now that, that's, I'm, I'm not sure that this is actually the case, but I would hope that's the case. You know, maybe some metadata in the trace will be different, but you know, that's what I mentioned earlier. Also, say you strip white space or something because it's not a semantically uh, meaningful unit in your protocol. Um, if you have an event that does not account for the white space or so, you would have to generate something that makes sense, even though it's not the true origin, original one but you could come up with a semantically equivalent representation. And if you have PCAPs in there though, and you start off with your con log analysis that I showed earlier, you can pretty much get to the original um, representation. If you, by original you mean, for example, the PDF, because the PDF is unaltered. Let's say spicy in the future, I'm actually working on that, a PDF analyzer. Um, if, you, if spicy has a PDF analyzer, you could take those elements inside the PDF and index them as events separately and then reconstruct the PDF space from that PDF structures and come up to the original representation. That's the goal. It might be reordered or something, but you will get render the same PDF at the end. So this is really up to you how you would like to design your data that it's, it's representable and useful. And that's also, I think, one of the key challenges that VAST is still facing. You as a user have to kind of think ahead uh, what is the apt way to model your data and apply types. It's not always easy. So, uh, uh, so that, that part is more, I mean, from your experience, from this whole nice system, the transformation part, the mapping part, that is the most uh, challenging part. Which part is most challenging? The most challenging part is getting the interactive response times. Really, the query execution, that's, that's, that's the goal, and that's, um, for that, the system has been designed. So the first step, so that was my next question. So uh, the raw data you are uh, using for this is the, the size. How much of size you are thinking about? So for the PCAP example, that was the best case scenario because you're really indexing a small fraction of the entire thing. Um, right now, I uh, have a overhead of, of the index varying. I, it's, it really depends on index type. So for, uh, say, uh, numeric types, it's a, it's a factor of two. And, and, and for some container type, it's, it's difficult to bound. It ranges between one and five. And so uh, that's something I'm trying to control to get to a constant function of the data. And I think once then I can give you a, a little bit of a better 
um, answer. I mean, I would like to give an answer soon, like with an event rate of x, you need to have that much disk space to get for a retention period of two months or something. That's like, I would like to get to that point where I can make that statement. I was not asking for index part, actually. Once we get the index, then that's just enough. Yeah. The archive is usually less than the base data because it has implicit compression. So you, if you wanted to ditch the original data, um, you would get some space savings from the archive. But the key part, that thing is a little larger um, than I would still want it to be. So when you, when you say real-time archive, it means it's not just calling time. Real time, I, I try to avoid, huh? So real time coding, coding is fun, but, uh, the most challenging part in the yes. is, so the data is just coming in at the stream. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're asking, is it hard to keep up with the input stream? And no, this is really not an issue. For one, because you can uh, create, re replicate those importer nodes on different nodes and spread the load across them. It's really, that's, you can bind really your components in a way where you provision for a large input stream, a large box. Um, and if you say have a, a, a juicy front end load balancer that can just distribute easily, then you're fine too. The, that, that, I think the architecture by design solves the, in the problem because there's not a single ingestion point. Okay.